Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You know this show, this is where I sit down with the most amazing humans and I do everything I can to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you be more awesome and live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today started out as an associate at Goldman and then through a radical transformation, launched his own company called Behance, which is the place if you're a creative to have your portfolio online. Now has more than 12 million creatives on that platform. He had that company acquired by Adobe. He's an author, he's an investor, and he's now the chief product officer at Adobe. He's my good friend, Scott Belsky, in the house. Chase, <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. love you. Appreciate you. I did, before the cameras started rolling, we were just talking, baby, Adobe Max, new book, <laughs> like all in the same 10 day period. <laughs> yeah, you can't really You look plan. great. You gotta just like roll with it. You nice. look great. <laughs> I don't know, what's the secret? The, uh, you know, the book, I mean, the book is a five plus year project and uh, two years ago, a pub date was chosen and then, you know, and I didn't really even know what role I would have at that time, what would be going on, Family whether there'd be a baby, <laughs> I mean, all this stuff just is colliding at once. But I mean, in some ways it's kind of meta because the book, The Messy Middle, is yep. all about navigating the volatility of a journey, of a bold creative project, of a yep. new venture, um, of a product turnaround. Yep. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's about the fact that you want to plan and you should plan, but then you have to realize quickly that nothing goes according to plan. So uh, everything is sort of uh, messy at this moment, which is just so appropriate, <laughs> don't you think? You just took my, that was gonna be my nutshell. It's like, and how <laughs> meta is this? But it's beautiful, I think. Great minds think alike. The, the, so, Second time on the show. Yes. First time, wildly successful. Hundreds of thousands of people loved the material. And I think it's because, well, if, let's go back to your earlier book called the, um, Making Ideas Happen. So many creatives, and I think this is something, the, the, the quote that I remember putting out on social, I think it was something like, um, so many great ideas die in the minds and on the desks and, and on the floors of creatives because they don't get their shit together. Yeah. And that just hits home with so many people, because you know the audience, really similar audience that you serve at Adobe, creators and entrepreneurs. And, uh, and as I was reading the new book, which is again, The Messy Middle, Must Buy, I was, it, it reminded me that despite how messy stuff is, like having a point of view, being flexible, and actually being organized is really key to this. So you, you put a, a very interesting layer on the creative industry. How did you come about to look at this? Was it from inside the creative industry when you looked around and said, all oh, this stuff's broken? Was it back in your sort of Goldman days with your business hat on? Like, you have a very unique perspective to be a part of the creative industry. Where did you get that? Yeah, well, before, um, before going into the business world after college for a few years, um, I was both, I was studying, I was at Cornell studying both design and business as an undergrad. And I was always kind of torn between, do I go to this creative direction yep. um, or do I go the business route? And uh, that's always been the epicenter of my interests has yep. been like how business and creativity overlap. Yep. Uh, I, always, I actually think that the greatest companies and books are, are, are inspired by some sense of frustration. You know, Making Ideas Happen, my first book, and Behance, was really inspired by my frustration with my friends in the creative world yeah. who uh, had some of the most you know, interesting ideas and great creative talents, but just seemed so disorganized. Yeah. And I realized, gosh, like one of the most um, important communities on the planet that makes life literally interesting for all of us and helps us engage in every part of our lives is also the most disorganized community on the planet. What do we do about this? Yeah. And, uh, and it was that dose of frustration that inspired like 10 years of my work. And, and similarly with The Messy Middle, I guess the frustration that inspired this book was how much we're obsessed with the starts and finishes of everything. We <laughs> love talking about the romanticism of the start, you know, when people 
leave their job and start something new and take a risk in their careers, or someone sets off to write the next great American novel, or whatever it is at the start. The moment of conception is fun, and it's <laughs> exhilarating, and everyone wants to tune in for it. And then everyone loves to celebrate the finishes, whether it's a great finish, um, like an IPO or an acquisition, or a launch of a project, or a book, or a piece of art, or whatever, or or a horrible finish. People love covering bankruptcies, and <laughs> going out of business, and everything else. And with all these sensational headlines and pithy um, sort of summaries of like five to 10 year journeys, you know, we're left kind of confused, scratching our heads, wondering what to make of this. Yeah. And when people even ask me about my own experience or my career, I'm like, well, yeah, you know, got, you know, founded Behance back in 2005, 2006, you know, bootstrap for five years, venture back for two years, acquired by a company, integrated it. It's like great with like three sentences and a bow, <laughs> you know, everything's just like, looks perfect. When yeah. in fact, as you know, as well as I, like it's anything but. Um, <clears throat> and I know this. <laughs> <laughs> the five years of bootstrapping, yeah. I mean, there were many times where we thought of throwing in the towel. There were moments where things were working and then things where we felt like we were working amidst complete ambiguity, yep. uncertainty, and anonymity for years on end. Yep. I was on my honeymoon when we had three months left of runway and I was like, is this irresponsible? But this is also one of the highlights of my life. Like, what the hell do I do with this? And yep. then. You know, and, that, and that just continued. So, so that's the frustration yep. that inspired me to to try to pull out the insights for the middle volatility from a lot of the leaders and entrepreneurs and executives and writers and artists that I most admire for their long game. Yeah, there's a there's a handful of interviews in the book or, or snippets. Uh, I think what you just talked about is just a beautiful piece in the book where you actually give your three sentences like you did right here. Like, yeah. this is what I've said for the last five years about my, the previous, you know, 10 years of my life. I right. summarize it in three sentences. And it tells you nothing. And it really tells you nothing. Right. And that's what I find about, you know, everything that we have here on Creative Live and my own personal journey. I built my individual social following 10 years ago on the back of letting people into the photography industry yep. because no one was talking about it. It was like, oh great, it's like models on the beach and the, and and then there's just this great finished ad campaign or starting a film and finishing it at the awards. There's no real documentation about the inside. So let's focus in on that just for a second. And there's a great, I think the book is largely based on a graph. Mm -hmm. And forgive me for over summarizing it's this. True. And it's beautiful. <laughs> Um, you can you, your your design sentiment is very present here, and it's it's an intersection of design and business because it starts out at the start, and then you, as soon as you're like beyond the emotion of starting, you basically have a crash, and then it's we're gonna figure this out. Oh shit, we're gonna get better. We're dying, and it's right. just this this amazing mm -hmm. up and down. And now you talked about some, and I'm gonna avoid just glazing over them like you did, like we almost ran out of money, and I was on my honeymoon. And I'd like to dive into some of those, because I think with the goal of helping people understand that yeah. even you who is has achieved a lot sitting here, that there's been some very scary moments. Yep. So let's go to the one where you were on your honeymoon. I think you captured this beautifully in the book, talking about 20% of your brain right. not being present, yeah. like literally on your honeymoon. Yep. Help us feel aligned with you, help us understand that Scott oh, man, is imperfect too. I to go back too. to this moment in my life, uh, painful. No, it's, it, it was, uh, it, it really um, was about, um, and especially that moment, learning to bear the burden of processing constantly some degree of uncertainty and how um, any creative brain uh, has to devote some amount of itself to processing uncertainty yeah. in the background. And it's not that you're looking for an answer to a problem you're trying to solve. It's actually you're processing the problems you don't know you have yet and what those might be and how you might solve them. It's just like kind of existential crisis in the back of your mind at all times. Because in truth, you're, you know, you're going against the, the headwinds of society, right? Yeah. I mean, every, everything about the construct we live in, it's an immune system that kills off anything that's new. Yeah. And that's actually how we keep the water running. And that's also how we keep our teams productive, is we kill off anything that's new, and anybody that's new, by the way. Yeah. And, uh, and in order to sort of break that out, break through that, you have to be constantly processing what's going on, and that's just sort of the burden, right, that we all carry if you're creating something new. So, um, so I talk a little bit about that in the beginning, and uh, as well as how to brace yourself for the long game, and in some ways short circuit the reward system that governs you. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we uh, we are so used to 
things like the weekly salary and uh, and the gratification from bosses or parents or colleagues or customers. But when you have none of that yet, yeah. when you have no customers yet and no revenue and what do you what do you do to supplement that? I don't think that the long term vision of what may be five years from now is actually sufficient. That might be enough to get you to jump in and start. Yeah. It's not enough to get you to continue and and, and and endure over time. So you're on your honeymoon and you have this going in your in the back of your mind, like we've got three months worth of cash left, and do you just keep going? Like what's the solution? Because right now there's a thousand whoever's watching this they are doing the same thing. They're having a child, they're you know, trying to leave a job, they're trying to put food on the table, and they've got like real commitments yeah. you know, in another part of their life. Is it compartmentalization? Is it endurance? Is, it, uh, you know, is this a, a muscle that we can strengthen? Sure. So give us, get tactical for a second. Well, I think first of all, it's, it's about accepting this burden as part of the um, creative dilemma, if you will. Okay. Uh, and not necessarily fighting it because it is just par for the course, yeah. right? Uh, I think obviously compartmentalization is part of it. Um, can you can you do something to kind of tend to the um, you know the the uh, sort of uncertainty, um, but also can you limit the amount of energy you spend on what I like to call insecurity work? There's yeah. a lot of stuff that we do that we do just to assure ourselves that everything is okay, but doesn't move the ball forward this in any particular way. brilliant in the book, I love Well, I mean, this. it's you know looking at analytics, looking at Twitter social feeds, looking at just consistently looking at things to assure yourself that it's okay, even though what you're doing is not moving anything forward. We have to become aware, oh, what am I doing right now? I'm doing insecurity work. I'm doing stuff that just to keep me at bay in this period of uncertainty. and. When you identify work as such, then the, then it's easier to actually compartmentalize it to a period of time. So actually, what I would do is I would look at a period every day, you know, from four to five p.m. or something, where I would say this is the time where I can just like do all that stuff that really is just for my own self. Let's you know, security. let's put some things in that bucket. What is insecurity? It's like checking your social feeds to see if you're trending up or down. Or let's just Google put Analytics. How many people came to Behance today? You know, how many new portfolios were actually published? Um, how much, uh, you know, what's our SEO in this area that we're focusing on? What are our revenues in this? What are, I mean, all these little things you could consistently look at. Searching Behance on Twitter, yeah. my goodness, like how much, t t how many times did I hit that API with like Behance, 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 because I wanted to yeah. see, you know, that was the source of truth for what people thought of our brand and whether yeah. people liked it or didn't like it or were struggling or if there was a bug out there. Yeah. Like all of this stuff surfaced from community. And I could do that all day, every day, just to make myself assured and never do anything productive in the business. So I had to compartmentalize all of that stuff to a small period of time. He's talking to you. <laughs> just in case you're listening right now, he's talking to you and me and the rest of and us. And myself, because yeah. listen, I, I try to be a, a player as well as a coach in this department. <laughs> you, you did a nice job of walking that line in the book. Um, and so if we're compartmentalizing that work, then is there a, and, and is there a, um, is there an anecdote, an antidote to that? Like it, when, is there a realization process or are you, is it just up to each of us to identify that for ourselves and put it in a bucket? Like what are the list of things that are not, what are the th list of things that are moving us forward? Is it just anything that's not in that category? Yeah, well it's, I think it's, it's down to the list of things that, um, that can make an impact and over time a material impact. So uh, most of the things you do to assure yourself are actually, they could be done monthly, weekly, they could be done by somebody else and reported to you if there's something off plan, otherwise yeah. just assume everything's great. Yeah. But reaching out to customers and asking them how they're doing, how are you struggling, like, yeah. what can we do to better serve you, that's, that's meaningful. Yeah. Uh, going over all of the to-dos and making sure that things are prioritized properly. Sitting down and having one-on-ones with people, recruiting, like always finding more and more candidates. What yeah. can you do to channel that that tendency towards insecurity work, towards kind of productive action, is the kind of thing we always have to hold ourselves to. The hard part is that that stuff that we're doing, that action, isn't giving us the assurance that everything is okay, like the insecurity work we just discussed. So yeah. this is part of the, you know, the 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 mental challenge that we all have to play. And people, I find that people like me lie to myself about no, this is if I don't have this information, 
then I'm actually not going to be effective because I need to know if the last three posts, I'm just trying to think like sure. all of our listeners thinking that, good, like, right. yeah, then I need to change my game. So this is actually really critical data. How do we, that's a slippery slope. And by the way, you're right. I mean, we should know. It's just a matter of compartmentalizing that stuff so it doesn't seep out into our into our life. Like, for example, the uh, the time limits that the new uh, Apple iOS 12 imposes on us. Pick I wish I could impose that on stuff that I just do out of my own kind of self-assurance needs. Yeah. And it would be great if you had it, you have an hour every day where you can just feed yourself with everything you need to know to make, you know, to feel like you're on the right track. <laughs> but then at that point, like it stops you. Yeah. And uh, that would be uh, hopefully the next iteration of our, our, uh, our self discipline software. How are you doing with that, by the way? I am constantly, well, it came out right before book week for me. Yeah. So I am just like 15 minutes, 15 more minutes, 15 more minutes. Um, but it's, uh, but I love. Do listen, you put I a governor on? Do you put a governor on your? And have you? It's I did. Yeah, yeah, okay. I did. And uh, because I just want to be, to me, it's like just I want to be aware of what I'm doing. Yeah. I feel like that's probably the first step towards a better outcome. I think Kevin Rose hacked it. I don't know if you know you know Kevin very yeah. well, of course. Uh, put a rubber band on his phone, just as a remind r around oh, it. Oh, really? So you you can feel it when you touch it. <laughs> you can see it, and you're like. Do I actually want to pick up my phone That's right great. now? It's like the red little bracelet from, uh, you know, like Zen type <laughs> stuff or whatever. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Right. Um, so anyway, I, I've been experimenting with that. I did it last week and I found, I found it really interesting because it signaled to me before I actually touched my phone right. how much we pick it up. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And I put that in, in, the, in the bucket with distractions and you, I think, mm -hmm. again, insecure. Uh, totally. What is it one more time? Inse insecurity work. Insecurity work. Um, all right. So... If the start is beautiful and yep. emotional and spirited, and the end is a great story, either good or bad, and the middle is endurance and use the word optimization. Yes. So I think optimization is pretty self-explanatory. You want to get better in small incremental steps. I want to talk about endurance yeah. because that is a thing that I, I, when I, the more I talk to people in our community, they believe falsely that these are overnight successes and that once you have a success, that equals success in the long term. Yep. Um, talk to me about your own journey in as concrete a set of terms as possible and how endurance played the role in your success. Sure, well, uh, well I think when you think about the volatility, right, uh, the lows are where you have a need to obviously endure the pain that comes along with them. And the highs are the things you're doing, whether it's in your product, your team, or just your own intuition and, and approach to leadership that you should continue doing as well. Yeah. What's strange is that we have this saying of, you know, don't fix it if it ain't broken, which suggests that anything that's working you should not focus on. But we both know that that's the opposite. It's I mean, literally the opposite. To make a great organization and product, and they're related, you have to be doing more of anything that's actually working. Yeah. And that's what optimization is all about. Um, but uh, but the, the other realization with this graph, and then we'll go to the endurance question, sure. is that um, we are not our best selves, whether we are in the valleys or the peaks. When we're at those lows, we start making decisions out of fear. Yeah, It's like, oh my goodness, something's not going well. And we, that taints our judgment, and, um, and it starts, we start to you know, copy a competitor and make an inferior product, or uh, we just start to churn our own roadmap and, and disappoint or confuse our team. And it's, uh, we're really not our best selves. We're also not our best selves at the peaks. Yeah. Because when we're at the peaks, first of all, we start to get high on ourselves. The ego gets in the way. Yeah. And we start to falsely attribute the things that we did to the things that work. And that's when companies lose their sense of self-awareness or people lose yeah. their sense of self-awareness. So I think that that's, you know, that's some concept of why the volatility is so tricky, right? Because we're not our best at either the lows or the highs. Yeah. Um, now, let's talk about endurance for a little bit. Endurance is really about bracing yourself for the long game. And, uh, and when it comes to your team, narrating your team through this journey. The analogy I use in the book is it's like driving a 10-day road trip with your team in the back seat with the windows blacked out. They can't see where they are or if they're sitting in traffic or if they're making any progress. And you and your narration of the yeah. journey, we're crossing state lines, there's a monument on the left, we're making progress, we're a third of the way. Anything you tell them actually makes them stick it out and not go stir crazy in the back seat. Yeah. Uh, and that narration is extraordinarily important. 
It means that um, we have to merchandise progress to our teams. I like the merchandising. It's not we, like you're hiding or showing or flaunting or not. You have to merchandise, you have to package it for them to consume it. Right, and I think the, uh, the assumption that people will just see the progress we're making is wrong. And I know a lot of great founders who I think are really great leaders, but they're so efficient and they're not promoters at all. Yeah. And as a result, they fail to merchandise to the team the progress that we're making. And in the book, I talk about this research by a professor at Harvard Business School named Teresa Amabile, who had thousands of people um, do these journals and journal entries every day, talking about how motivated they feel and um, and kind of what you know and what feedback they got that day, and basically found this correlation with progress being in the best kind of motivator for future progress. And so it's this like chicken and egg thing. Yeah. You need to feel you're making progress to make more progress. And when you're enduring those lows, nothing is more powerful than being told like we are we are making progress. Now that being said. You can't celebrate fake wins. Yeah, and I also talk in the book about how a lot about that how dangerous it is. Right, we look for we look for um, things to motivate our teams, and sometimes we actually manufacture fake wins, like or we'll, celebrate the wrong things, or celebrate the wrong things. Like everything you are celebrating, and you yeah. should make up all sorts of celebratory moments, but they should all be towards the end, right? They should all be things that condone the right behavior, as opposed to paying for an award, you know, and then being like, the, team. I think you say, in the book you say, pay for press and then celebrating the press that you got. Yeah, <laughs> that, is, that is actually incentivizing the exact wrong behavior, yeah. right? We don't want to yeah. get fake press and then celebrate it. Yeah. Um, but you should make up your own milestones by all means. I mean, I talk about uh, in the book the, uh, you know, the fact that even in the early days, Behance you know, was a made up word and we would type it into Google and it would always say, do you mean enhance? Do you mean enhance? Do you mean enhance? We do you like, mean Beyonce? Yeah, right. And we were like, do you, do you, why can't we just not be a mistake? You know? And so lo and behold, like, that was one of our first goals yeah. that motivated our SEO efforts and also motivated, more importantly, us to get more creatives work on the platform so that we would have more links and more link backs. And yeah. lo and behold, like six months later, Behance was a, a, a recognized term in Google's index. So there are all kinds of fun things we did that motivated us in the right way. Got it. So if we're thinking about... Um you talked about, you just framed that really elegantly in terms of a company and a founder. Yep. But when you are on your own road trip mm -hmm. and you're a solopreneur, an independent artist, it can still feel like you're on a road trip with the windows blacked out. Totally. <laughs> so help me map that same sort of uh, narrative onto an independent. How does an independent, because what you just talked about is merchandising for some people in the back seat when yep. you can see where you're going. So what about the independent creator? Because right. we're scared. We don't know where we're going, and we're, we kind of get glimpses out the windshield. Yeah. But well, listen, I mean, in some ways, I can relate to that in this process of writing the book, because I was doing it amidst a full-time job and everything else in my life. It's a solo project, yeah. and, uh, and what I had to do is hack my own reward system to stay up to the beat of where I needed to be. Yeah. Part of that is finding some folks who are advisors to you, who you um, can look to for some accountability. And I hired a woman named Georgia to be an editor in the process, yep. and I kind of said to her when we first had coffee, one of your biggest jobs is just to hold me accountable to a schedule. Yeah. Like, nag me, please. I mean, nagging from other folks is a form of natural selection. It just gets you to start paying attention to the thing that you're being poked about, yeah. and I recognized that I needed some dose of that. Um, and I think. Anyone who's working on their own benefits from community to some extent, even if you don't have a team. Yeah. The other thing is to just make those milestones for yourself and your own rewards for them. So if you are planning on you know, going to Europe in three months, what do you promise yourself you'll get done before you get on that plane? Um, or otherwise you can have no pasta while you're in Europe. Um, <laughs> there was a woman I met who, uh, 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 an independent illustrator who was talking about putting up her own kind of website and like kind of making herself official as an independent illustrator for hire. And she told me that uh, she promised herself that in some period of months she would have that up. This is a woman in her late 20s. Or she would force herself to write a letter to her high school guidance counselor saying that she ultimately became a failure. And she said that that was such an awkward concept. Like, what would she say? How would she find his address? Like, the thing in her mind, the story was so strange that she became extremely scared of not getting her website and launching her sort of her shingle uh, you know, up on time. You know, yeah. and and so that was just a mental hack, right? Yeah. That we use to uh, keep ourselves on track. That's beautiful. You've got this 
uh, endurance metaphor. I don't want to leave that alone yet because you haven't given me some of your personal endurings. Mm -hmm. You talked about being uh, scared about running out of money, but one of the best things, uh, we, I think in the book you actually reference this, but one of my favorite books as an entrepreneur is The Hard Thing About Hard Things, mm -hmm. written by some of both know, Ben Horowitz um, and Dreesen Horowitz. And what I loved about it is every other book business book, it tells you a story of what it's like when it's perfect. Yeah. Like, when you start out, do it like this. Of course, you would never do it like this. Do it like this. And if you do it like this, it works perfect. Then do it like this, and it works perfect. But the reality is, appropriately titled, The Messy Middle, is 99% of things don't go as planned, and you're always adjusting. And what Ben did well in that book, and I recommend it for anyone who's in that sort of world, is he talked about things like how to fire a friend, yep. what to do when you have no money, what to do when you, you know, there's like a, just a list of stories. So can you give us like two or three of your personal anecdotes around what you found that you had to endure and the lesson that you learned from it? Yeah, and um, you know, I include some ben, some points from Ben in the book because he, um, you know, he, he brought to the surface some of these, you know, extraordinarily awkward yet critical moments, right? Yeah. One of the things that um, I talk about in the book is uh, when I did have to let someone go yeah. or, or kill a product that was working. Yeah. There were a number of moments where there were very difficult decisions to be made because they in some ways weren't obvious or uh, were always easier to kick down the, the road. Yeah. Um, and when you, when you fail to make a decision, you create you know, what I talk about in the book as organizational debt. It's the accumulation of decisions that should have been made but weren't. Yeah. And your job as a leader is to just make them. So there were instances where I had to let someone go. Um, we, had a pro we had a popular product called Action Method back in the day, which was a task management tool for creatives. Okay. And, uh, and we had, I think it was like 16,000 paid customers. It was growing at a decent rate. And we were using it ourselves, but it wasn't the the promise of the Behance network. It wasn't this notion of a, a, a single place for creatives to showcase and discover creative work. In our team, the energy was divided. Everything that we were doing on one of those products was 50% of what it could have been, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I kept feeling this inkling of people thinking, we just need to pick one. We need to pick one, we need to pick one. And everyone kind of knew which that, what that one was. We knew it was Behance. Yeah. And the thought of disappointing our customers and giving up a revenue stream that we so desperately needed at the time was impossible to come reconcile. I kept putting it off, like yeah. another month, another month, another month. And finally, uh, with a lot of candid discussions with the team, it became clear, like, Scott, you just have to make the call. Yeah. And, uh, and it was around that time where I would start whispering to myself on uh, frequent occasions, uh, Scott, do your fucking job. It's beautiful. And, DF <laughs> yeah, D-Y-F-J. Yeah, D-Y-F-J, right? <laughs> D-Y-F-J. Yeah. And I, I've said that to myself over the course of my career many times, and it's really what I say when I know what needs to be done, I know that a great leader would do this. Mm -hmm. And I know that my own either sensitivities or desire to wait for whatever reason is all that's getting in the way from doing what needs to be done. And I will just whisper that to myself and then I will do it. And, uh, and I think that's an important trait that we all have for ourselves and our own self-discipline. Yeah. It's to recognize those moments because a lot of careers get hung up with this cognitive load of I know what needs to be done, but I'm not gonna do it because of a million excuses. Just DYFJ. And if you're an independent, like that, it, it's exactly the same, but just applied to your own universe. You know you need to finish your milestone before you go to Europe. 100%. DYFJ. Or you have to fire that client. Yeah. You know, a lot of independent creatives that I know will talk about a sort of a lifeline of support from a client that just takes them off their game or yep. makes them do work they don't want yeah. to do but they feel that they just can't sort of cut the umbilical cord, so to speak. Yet when they do, they're creative, they creatively open up, they become more you know, permeable by other opportunities. It becomes one of the most important things they've done. Yeah. And, uh, and it's like, just do it. I mean, really, you, sure, do the mental math of whether this is, ready, this, this is something you should be doing, but if you know it's something that ultimately will, will happen, if you're like, yes, we will no longer do action method, or this client is not the right client for me, or whatever. Yeah. Why are you holding up your, your career and your life? Like, do it. Yeah, that's organizational debt. Or is that it right? is, yeah. yeah. It's accumulation of decisions that should have been made, but weren't. Uh, what's one of the hardest things that you did not expect in your journey on Behance? 
you didn't see it coming. One of the hardest. And I know, it, like any, I, as someone who gets interviewed yeah. a lot, like superlatives drive me crazy. Like your favorite book. No, no, like, no, come sure. on. Like so, but just like one that was very unexpected because I'm trying to like help people understand you can be as smart and prepared and all the stuff, and every we all feel like we get ambushed. Yeah. And I'm trying to. There were bear a, few, a few. There were a few themes, right? That or things that didn't that weren't expected that were very difficult to manage. I mean, one was just 2008. And you were a small technology company in New York in 2008. That was, uh, which is a time of uh, a brief kind of hiatus of growth and investment and everything else in the world. Um, we, the, the revenues we were making on talent recruiting and other parts of the Behance business uh, lines, sponsorship of our annual conference, which were ticket proceeds that we used to fund ourselves because we were bootstrapped, dried up, and uh, and suddenly I had to realize, wow, like. We have to make do with what we have. We can't hire those three new DevOps people and the one new designer. Like everyone, we we all need to do what we're doing, if not more, with less. Yeah. And that was a uh, uh, first of all, it's a negative message to send to the team because they're like, I thought we were growing. What's going on? People, um, how do you get people to like stick it out long enough to figure it out? Yeah. And uh, I think it was during this period of time where I learned to value resourcefulness over resources. Yes. You know, resourcefulness yeah. being this muscle memory of how to just manage any situation versus resources, which are like carbs. You yep. know, you just like, you can blow through them any amount that you have, you can just throw so them at problems true. and they go away for a moment. <laughs> so true. And so I think that going through a period of time like that, which is why if companies that I advise are not bootstrapped at all, I actually encourage them to give themselves a, 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 a slightly constrained budget. Like give your team the opportunity to develop the muscles of resourcefulness because they will always, always serve you over time. And I don't know anybody who doesn't ask for or want more resources. Of I'm, course, we all want to have the easier way. Like, right. You know, we all want a little sugar and we all want to do that. But the reality is just like constraints drive creativity, it's the same thing. As in, and again, Scott's framing a lot of this in a company setting, but the same is true for you. What can you do with limited time, limited budget, only make it purple, make it less than five feet tall, make it like, what yeah. are some constraints? And by the way, I remember when I was uh, interviewing a lot of creatives for Making Ideas Happen, yeah. and I would always ask them in the interviews, what, um, what, give me like a sense of what your worst project ever was. Like, what, what, what just was one of the hardest, you know, set up to fail type of projects you've ever had? And a number of people talked about a brief that was limit, unlimited from a client. Like a client basically said, listen, at this point, no budget, no constraints. Like, where do you want to go with this? Like, big open brief. And that oftentimes was the answer. And my takeaway from that was the power of constraints, as you said, Chase, for creativity. Yeah. All right. Nice job throwing us some, like, that's a hard thing. I get it. Let's flip over to the optimization side. And mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about optimization of uh, business processes and products for a yep. second. I want to go to a point that you made in the book about optimizing your person. Mm -hmm. Of course, you hearken our good friend Tim Ferriss, mm -hmm. who's the ultimate, <laughs> ultimate optimizer. optimizer, body hacker. Yep. Um, and share us a little bit about, first of all, the concept. Um, because I think optimizing yourself, and I, I just I expect people to be able to layer on this answer to with their own problems. So don't go specifically with what Scott's saying, but what did you mean by self-optimizing? And then I want to get a couple of examples of what you specifically do. Yeah, so. sure. Well, the um, the the self-optimize section of the book is about crafting your own instincts or, or and, and evolving them. Is um, about recognizing when you become less permeable to your colleagues and to the industry you're in or to the, the movements. Mm -hmm. um, it's, very, uh, it's very easy, especially when things are going well, to kind of shut ourselves off to all the, all the new opportunities. Um, and uh, I, and I, I like to say that I think in any craft or business or project, self-awareness is the ultimate competitive advantage because yep. it's understanding how people see you. And, uh, and how that's changing over time. And whatever you think, again, it worked because of what you did before versus timing and good luck and other people. I mean, it's amazing. We think that, uh, we think we're so self-reliant in the beginning, and then we realize just how much, how much more we are, rely on, we are on others around us. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we think that it's the, the, when things work well, it's because of us. When things don't work well, it's because of Them. timing, market, <laughs> yeah. customers, other, other people. It's other yeah. people's problem. Yeah. 
So the, 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 the self-optimization side of this is really about recognizing that that's wrong. And, uh, and asking yourself at every turn, you know, what is it that I could have done differently? How do you get that feedback as a form of compensation? Yeah. I mean, how often do our folks who are listening, uh, who have clients, even if you're an independent creative professional, how often are you asking your clients for feedback? And not just on the finished product, but hey, um, did my cadence of communication work really well with you? Is there anything that um, that I you know didn't set up properly in terms of expectations in the beginning? You know, what are the things you can ask for and get yeah. some gold yeah. uh, that you can leverage to make yourself the the ultimate person to work with? Yeah. We oftentimes leave that on the table. For sure, like, it's so obvious. That two two things I want to throw in there. My personal experience is one: when you ask someone for feedback, you have to ask it in a different way because normally you say. You know, how was the experience? People in that moment when they're just about to walk out the door will say, they'll just say, fine, it was awesome, so good, thank you, because they just want to get out of there. Right. Versus if you frame the question on like, can you give me one piece of feedback, or 21 or whatever, right. but yeah, one yeah. piece of feedback that if we could do anything different in this project. One nugget. Yeah, right. just give me one nugget. And yeah. people, I find that that just completely flips the script and they're like, awesome, because I want to give you this nugget. And it's usually something Again, this is, I'm thinking of the independent creative here, but it's usually something um, that is not related to the, to the creativity and to right. the art. Yep. It's usually process related yep. for most people who are like, starting their own businesses or a solopreneur or whatever. And to me, that is how I shaped my career as a photographer. Mm -hmm. And all of that, I was able to then carry forward into Creative Live and ask every instructor who's ever been on here, like, what's one thing that you would change? That's right. sort of like their exit interview. Yeah. And it, to me, it's, it's been radically successful. It so, also builds a relationship. Yeah, you know? there's trust. You do talk a little bit about trust in the book and about being able to connect with your customers, your peers, and especially the people you work with. Can yeah. you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think, um, and it's also related to the um, self-optimization yeah, yeah, yeah. piece. It's, it's just the, and it's also related to the product section of optimization. It's just continually gaining more and more empathy with your customer. Uh, I, I get frustrated when people go off and build a company or a product based on their passion for a solution to a problem, which actually seems like the most, that most people would do. The problem with that is that you can, through your passion, be so you know, thrust it into one particular direction that you end up with something that's 30 degrees off of what the customer actually needs. Yeah. And that's actually what gets in the way of that most, you know, that most that common product market fit yeah. conundrum. Uh, whereas if you are seeking empathy with the customer suffering the problem, if you're constantly trying to understand what their struggle is, shoulder to shoulder, you will always have a product that is more in line, right, with what they really need. And so getting more and more empathy and how do you prioritize the time you spend with customers and the questions you're asking? And how do you reconcile passion versus empathy? Because in truth, a lot of us as entrepreneurs, especially in creative professionals, yeah. we're passionate about our work. Yeah. Um, another thing is around conviction versus consensus. You know, how do you make sure that uh, we, we do want everyone's feedback, and we just talked about soliciting feedback, yeah. and at the same time, some of the most important decisions we ever make. Is ignoring that. <laughs> right, it's yeah. like ramping up the, the volume of your own intuition. Yeah. Uh, and how do you reconcile those two things? You know, we, we talk about in the book also, like conviction over consensus, and knowing the difference between cynicism and criticism, knowing when to gain confidence from being doubted, yeah. as opposed to recognizing that you're just on the wrong track and everyone else is right. And that's part of the you know the crafting of um, of intuition that self awareness is all about and and, and, uh, and and optimization is all about. Yeah. So let's keep on this this self self awareness tip. You've mentioned several times just in the last you know twenty minutes intuition. The word intuition has probably been said five times. I, to me, it's the most powerful thing that we have. And when you go against it, you pay. And um, the question that I get, and I'm an, a, a loud advocate of this, and the question that I most often get asked in response to it is like, how do you know when that's intuition or something else? Yeah. What's your answer to that question? Well, it's a good question because I actually feel like there's a, um, there's a common argument against intuition these days. And there's right. so much data, yeah. right, everywhere. And, and there, uh, there's a common set of beliefs that, um, that uh, these days that intuition is simply bias, and, uh, and that bias is bad. 
having any bias is just a, it's an emotional flaw, if you will. And, uh, and it, it also is the kind of thing that creates a lot of prejudice and like a lot of bad decisions that people make come out of bias, which inherently is intuition. Sure. This goes down to the art of business and the science of business, or the art of a craft versus the science of a craft. And, um, and I actually think that in most cases, we should be focusing on the data. We should be really scientific. And, uh, and in most instances, for example, when you're building a product or anything, uh, use familiar patterns. Don't try to be creative. Just use whatever's out there that people will recognize. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a guidebook for 90% of the journey. However, the art is seeing an edge that will someday become a center. The art is recognizing something that others don't notice or value yet. And where does that come from? It comes from the biases that we carry generated from our past experiences. The things that fascinate you because of the unique shape of the kitchen cupboard around you growing up that don't captivate me. You know, the mistake of the eye that I see yeah. that you fail to see. Like it's those things that we carry that, um, that make us notice and invest in things that aren't rational. And when, when, when people are irrational or unreasonable about something, you know, that is, that is how innovation happens. You're pounding the table about something that I just don't think is logical. And then you see something that I don't and that becomes that new center. So this is the, this is the conundrum here. We should be scientific, we should be data driven, yet we should be curious about the things that fascinate us that others overlook because sometimes that is, you know, the edge. Beautiful, well, super well said. And continuing on this thread of the, the self-awareness, you reference the Zen a lot. What's your connection to Zen? Why is it a, a pillar in the book? And is it, is it a pillar in your life? Or are you just looking for great quotes? Like what, <laughs> what's, what role does this play in your life? And is it something, you know, um, I just, I'll leave it at that. What's, what, what, what role yeah. does this play and, and how is it useful? Well, I think I, I'm fascinated by, you know, how forces balance each other out in... Um, you just use that, right? Art and science, data sure. and intuition. Yeah. It's all about, it's all about this kind of war uh, constantly between different forces within us and, uh, and around us. And I think, um, I, I don't like the notion of quelling this stuff. I like the notion of letting it rage, but have a balance within us. I think that that's interesting. The greatest creative partnerships I've had in my past are with people that are very different. I mean, my co-founder from Behance, uh, Matias Correa from Barcelona, you know, uh, was a typographer by background and a graphic designer. And, uh, and he and I were so different. And, uh, and he was on one, some extremes and I was on other extremes. And it, from that partnership, I really learned the, 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 bal the, the, the benefit of having two po uh, very, very like kind of powerful forces opposed to one another, yeah. but respecting one another. Yeah. And in some ways, I think that that is, uh, when you think of yin and yang and just sort of the different um, uh, kind of Eastern philosophies of, of, of the forces dictating life and movement and everything else, there's a lot there to, to mine and to, uh, to relate with. Oh, and I think, there's a, a, a quote that you pulled out, I think it's somewhere in the first third of the book about in order to sort of be on the path, you have to become the path. Mm -hmm. Can you reorient me to that? Is that right? Did I say that Yeah, right? it was something like along that. the lines of, um, it was something along the lines of the, you know, that everything we make is um, the, the DNA of that final product or service or creation, you know, is a reflection of the, of the path taken to create it. Yeah. When you use a product and um, and it doesn't make like the software and hardware just don't seem to take itself each other into account, you know it was done by internal factions at a company that don't talk to one another, yeah. that have different pro pro you know, processes and whatever else. Um, when you see creative collaborations between a brand and a creative, and you know that it was for money and not for like passion yeah. uh, or, or purpose, like you can tell. Yeah. You're like, oh, that brand just wanted to look cool and paid this women to do something really interesting for it. Like you can kind of, you can, you can distill from things we use, like what actually, the chemistry behind it. And so in some ways, what I was trying to say is that the, the, how we choose to navigate this path, how we choose to navigate the volatility and develop the, 
the make the tough decisions and develop the um, you know the the self awareness and everything along the way actually impacts the product. Yeah, uh, and it's we we typically think that that's not true for some reason. Thank you for that. There's uh, going back to our our friend Tim. Time I find is something that I've written a lot about and how important it is to manage it and how graceful it is when you get some and that it's a requirement for so many creative processes. Um, you, you, there's a little story in the book about Tim and how, how to say no and ranking, like how important is this for you on a one to 10? And Tim Ferriss is the master at this. He's the master. So, but I would like to hear your explication and just to signal, I think, uh, about the, what the contents of the book, you don't have to go, you don't have to do the whole thing, but just signal for us your view on time uh, the management of it, the the defending of it, because um, I think the first book was very much about getting shit done. It's like yeah. managing, and it's like, yep. but there's another part of time which you have to allow space for creativity. And, and so, mm -hmm. talk to me about time. You, you can reference Tim. I was just mostly yeah. hearkening to that. No, I think it's a, uh, and I don't. I'm not an expert on this one. I uh, am fascinated by how do we better protect our time? You yeah. Know, how do we? You know, I talk in the book about how interesting it is that we'll trade time for money when we're young and then money for time when we're older and how this kind of shift happens at yeah. some point in people's lives oftentimes uh, because of how precious it is and how we'll never, you know, it, we'll never get it back. The calendar is the ultimate um, reflection of your values. If you go back and see how you spent your time this week. Time and money, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is ultimately the source of truth. And if you're going to audit yourself, which is a somewhat painful thing to do, yeah. what you'll find is that some percentage of your time is spent doing things as favors for others because you couldn't say no, even though you wanted to. Yeah. And I do talk in the book also about the types of things we do that we did because we wanted to or we f because we felt compelled to and how to kind of navigate or balance the two. Um, and you know, and when those trades are worth it, and when they're when they're not, and and uh, I'm I'm still trying to figure this out. I, I've also been thinking recently, and you know, not in the book, but I've been having a few conversations, including one friend who's like a very famous YouTuber, um, and uh, and video artist who is considering taking a major sabbatical, and. Uh, and I think about someone like Stefan Sagmeister, for example, who every seven years takes a year off, right? And just totally unplugs, and that is his well of creativity for the next seven year period of yeah. his life. How do we, what's the benefit of time for creativity? We think we can just output, we think we're just chemistry, yeah. and it can kind of trick ourselves into staying with it, but in fact, there is some replenishment that happens, and uh, and it's, it's, it's a reality, and I'm, just, I'm still, try, still trying to figure out how to manage that in my life as well. So what, do you, what are some things you do do? Like how do you audit your calendar, and when you audit your calendar, what do you typically find that you want to change? Well, I think, I, um, I think it's hard to say no to people who you care about. Yeah. And, uh, and so everyone always wants more time, and it's like, a, you know, I have a family now, uh, I have kids, and there's never enough time, right? Yeah. And so it's, uh, and then I have my own interests I want to feed, and I have my work commitments to my team, and uh, and there's just some time you spend one-on-one -on -one with somebody that can't be economized. Yeah. And so how do you say no to more? How do you just say no um, to more? And, and I do think these days about, um, and Tim talks a little bit in the book about how you can explain to someone, I am, this is where I am right now, I'm underwater, if you really, really need this of me because you're a friend, I will be there for you. Yeah. Otherwise, like I, it's just a bad time. And just put people on that in that on that position. And he says, like his close friends understand, and if they really, really need it of him, like he'll do it for them. That's called clarity, right? I think because we all ask so many things. Our culture is very social. We're social sure. people, especially yep. with someone that you like and respect and admire. And but those are also the people who, if they're really those people, will understand that. If it's a 10, I will, I'll be all in. I'll do right. all of this for you. But if it's like a four and you just need an introduction to this person and it's a, like, I don't, I don't have it. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, we both probably struggle with this where people reach out and say, I would love 10 minutes of this or that or, you know. <laughs> How many coffees have you had? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, and, um, and, you know, on the one hand, I want to be generous because there were certain people that were generous to me yeah. when I was getting started. Of course. And so I've, I've established some of my own filters uh, in my life to, 
make sure that I still do spend some time with people that I want to mentor and whatever, yeah. but that it's a little bit higher touch and or and it's a little bit more sacred and thoughtful. Yeah. Um, but it's I think it's something that we all uh, are working on. You know, I wish I was an expert in this front because. I do, though, find that the calendar audit is a very interesting exercise, and I try to do it. Usually, every few weeks, I'll find myself on a plane, and I'll literally just go through the last few weeks and, and just try to understand, what did I do? Why did I have that meeting? Did I get anything out of it? Did I give anything during yeah. it? Should it have ever happened? And how do I start to learn? I actually have my EA do that because I found that I couldn't honestly audit <laughs> my own stuff because I would credit right. that meeting, that one-on-one -on -one with, oh, and then I think you know that helped me unlock right. this. And, and so I would credit that to productivity and right. having somebody else who um, objectively, I mean, not everyone has, maybe it's a teammate or something like that, but I think it's a super healthy exercise. Yep. Um, so it's, I think it's interesting that we share this obsession with time. Um, what is something that you spend a disproportionate amount of time on that either you surprise yourself or other people would be surprised to know? Hmm. Like, what do you over-index on? Like, what do you spend, way is it reading or meditation or uh, consuming product briefs from your team? Or what is something that you way over-index on relative to your peers or that surprises you or other people? Well, I think, uh there's different parts of my life where there are different answers to that question. Okay. Um, if you ask the teams that I work with, they would probably tell you that I have an obsession with um, the, what I like to call the first mile of experience that, that customers go through. I think, and whether it's a retail brand or a store, you know, um, I was on the board of a company called Sweetgreen for some period of time. Amazing. Or, yeah. you know, just different, uh, it doesn't matter. I, I really am obsessed with that uh, initial experience that customers have in anything. And I think that it's largely overlooked um, what what that is because people are so focused on the core experience that they don't think about kind of the biases people come into any experience with. Yeah. Um, what what are the defaults? What do people see first? What are they told first? How are they told it? You know, are they are they given something to make them feel successful up front or are they trained do they have to be trained or do they have yeah. to be just you know, I, I, I find I, I probably over index in my professional life in that area because I just have a strong conviction and that that's something that's really special. Yeah. And um, I also, um, I, I think I also look for uh, unexpected experiences. I don't know how else to frame it. Okay. Every now and then I will get invited to, you know, give a talk in some place I've never been or whatever. And I, I do find that if you don't build like one or two opportunities for adventure every year, that they just won't happen. Yeah. And the more established your life becomes and family and every other responsibility. Isn't it weird how those things just like, they just, they crop up. And you, well, you start to, and you start to limit the opportunity yeah. for yeah. something to surprise you. Yeah. It's almost like everything becomes like, you know, scheduled and planned. And uh, I, I try to preserve those, those periods and, um, and it gets increasingly hard, but it's, uh, it's important. It's part of the, it's part of the, um, the, the inputs of creativity, and um, it also keeps me on my toes a little bit. Can you give me an example? Yeah, I mean, a few years ago, I accepted an invitation to speak at this school called Chaos Pilots that is um, in, um, in Belgium, so, yeah, I believe. Was, yeah. um, and, uh, and it was just you know, a small little town in the middle of nowhere, um, and it was a group of students who were all into studying creativity. And I, first of all, wanted to understand what that meant. Like, what does it mean to say even in high school and college age, like, I want to study creativity? And it wasn't design. It wasn't like an art yeah. specifically. It was just creativity. Uh, it also went against kind of my beliefs that it's less about the ideas and it's more about the execution. And so I kind of wanted to challenge myself with what an environment the other end of the, the under, other end of the spectrum would look like and feel like. And I yeah. landed in this you know, town that I've never heard of with signs I couldn't recognize, you know, and I was solely reliant on maps, you know, to like figure out where am I supposed to go here. But it was just one of those, you know, external experiences. I didn't expect it. A lot of stuff hit me that I didn't, uh, you know, already. And it was one example. So that's in the macro. Now let's talk about in the micro in your personal life, not professional life. I think that's one of the reasons I'm probing here is because I love that. I think yeah. knowing that you're obsessed over the first mile, I think that's something that people want to know. And then it's nice to know that you want these big adventure moments, but what about in your day-to-day? -day? Like, what do you disproportionately spend time on? 
And I'm sorry yeah, to keep pushing no, probably, this. this is probably like, the answer is pretty easy, cooking. Yeah. You know, I, I do like to, I, I like the, the, um, the sort of meditative ex aspects of like making something. And, um, and it's not always the most efficient thing from a time perspective because. Right. It's easy know, to press the button yeah, and there's food so show do, up, right? right. So, but um, in these days, you know, with uh, all these different you know, services that deliver the ingredients or obviously delivery services and whatever else, but I just enjoy the process of making stuff. And, um, and you know, cooking is an excuse to do that whenever I can. All right, if we talked about the beginning is joy, the middle is messy, title of the book. Obviously, we've got, we're, you know, we, we're, we've got uh, endurance and uh, we're optimizing, we're fixing. The end, as you said, is always, it's just, even if it was a horror story or if it was this, we're standing on the mountain, everything is great. So what about these end stories should we keep in mind? Yeah to keep us going in the middle? Because is, are we just waiting for a good story? Right. Like you talked about being in the middle, the messy middle, and trying to like, what are the things that are keeping you going to that end state? Be it fiery death or uh, we would all like to be successful, but like when you're tunnel vision, like are you, is it eye on the prize? Is it the greatest good for the, like, what's, what keeps us going? To well, this the, starry finish. Sure, and and uh, there are a few things. I mean, first of all, in the in the book, I talk about I call, I call it the final mile, and there's a period towards an end, and it's not always the end. It might just be a, an <laughs> end, end, right? Though, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a different sport altogether. A lot of stuff changes. Uh, one of those things that you have to do is stay in the early innings. And uh, you know, at Facebook, when you go around, there's stickers that say like, "We're still in the first inning. We're still in the first inning." There's a mentality at a lot of companies and for a lot of creatives that um, we have to kind of stay grounded with stuff we don't know, with the questions as opposed to all the answers we've learned. There's a sense of killing off the work you have done in order to enable new work to take hold. Yeah. And I think a lot of um, artists and designers know exactly what I'm talking about. When, as soon as you become well known for something, it, it becomes almost like a, a, a constraint yeah. that um, that you feel you have to do more of and stay imprisoned by. Um, and I think a lot of weird stuff starts to happen towards the finish line. There's a sense of, uh, of uh, identity crisis as you associate yourself with your work and, um, and it may become one, one thing. And that's tough because how can you then ever hope to do something better if you feel like what you've done is you? and you just kind of get stuck a little bit. So this notion of recognizing you are not your work and, and, and separating is very hard after a five to 10 year journey. Yeah. Um, Self-sabotage. There's a lot of uh, weird stuff that happens with people uh, wanting to obstruct their own success because they feel subconsciously that they don't deserve it. And I talk in the book about some stories of of employees who towards the finish line of our journey started to really act out and do weird things in their personal lives or in the workplace. And I became convinced that they were doing this because they were in some ways uncomfortable with the outcome that they were about to have. And what is that, why does that happen? Um, so that's, that, that's some of the, the final mile uh, analysis. But the, the truth is, is we wanna stay in the messy middle. I mean, to be done is to die. To quote Umberto Eco, you know, either growing or dying. Yes, yeah. Exactly, and uh, and I think that part of the part of the challenge is to uh, stay in the thick of it as much as you can. All right, one more section, and it's just going to be a speed round about Scott Belsky. But before we do, uh, I was I would like to ask the favor: Would you look into this camera, or for the folks who are listening, mm -hmm. just keep doing what you're doing right now, and give the nugget of advice that was not in the book. Give the nugget that you, because afterwards, when you're, you're promoting the book now, you've written it, you actually finished it probably, if I'm guessing, based on book publishing about a year ago. Right. So there's some things that didn't make it in there, or one thing, it doesn't have to be the superlative again, but like, yeah, yeah. what's the thing that's not in there that if you could snap your fingers and put it back in there, it would be there? Hmm. That's a good question. We've had time. I got a whole cup of water here. We've got time. Don't feel. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of. Yeah. What did what did what didn't make the cut or, or what um what kind of 
Because you've learned something. Presumably, this I'm going to give you a, a, this might help narrow it. Yeah, yeah. Something's happened in your life since then. Sure. Maybe it's your new role at Adobe. Uh, maybe it's you have a new child, so you have a new sort of vision on, I don't know what it is, but maybe yeah. it's something that's happened that well, you I didn't think, have. I think, that, I think that one of the things that I have learned um, recently in my life through the process of being an investor and then writing this book and then um, I'm looking at the camera. Sure, okay. yeah, <laughs> deliver. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned more recently uh, in my life is the the desire to feel fully utilized and how in some ways maybe happiness is not about retiring and having time off or just being able to bask in your creativity or having the life you think you aspire for because it would be less tense, less anxiety and more relaxing. What if in fact happiness comes down to the sensation of feeling fully utilized where your skills are being put to the test, where you're being continually challenged. And, um, and that's one of the things I've thought about a lot more recently, because during the book, I was fretting the idea of writing more and more while having a full-time job. I didn't, I felt too overwhelmed. And actually, what I realize now is that I was happier feeling fully utilized than I am feeling partially utilized. And maybe that's the whole notion of a side hustle and of people investing in side side interests and making sure that your life is full and full and then when you're when it's full you feel like you want to um take it easy and maybe uh we think we do but maybe we don't beautiful speed round this is about you okay you're, you're very good at, at answering these existential questions i like to know that you like to cook <laughs> what are you cooking well i'm a lifelong vegetarian yes and so, uh, and so I'm. I've heard you also were like you're, you. You one of the prizes that you hung out there for your team was that if we get this thing accomplished, if we ship this product, I'll try this strange meat. Is that true? That is. It, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was, it's called hacking the short-term reward system. Yep. And for some reason, the team felt especially motivated by me <laughs> eating meat. So, okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> back to the question. I just thought that was a hilarious line in the book. So, um, so but, what do you uh, cook? Yeah, no, I, I, I love. Uh, I, all kinds of all kinds of vegetarian creations. I mean, I'm just trying to make food tasty. So, uh, so stir fries and and uh, big Asian? wok extravaganzas, Asian fusion type okay. things, great Italian meals, making pasta. I mean, you make your own pasta. I have. Nice. Um, you talk about bold outcomes. What's a bold outcome from your career? Well, I think a bold outcome means making something that exceeds your own expectations. What exceeded your own expectations in your career? The reach of Behance exceed my, exceeded my own expectations. I think the, uh, the reach of my first book, Making Ideas Happen, certainly exceeded my expectations. And also the people that I brought on the team and the people they've now become as leaders, whether they're still working with me or in other companies or have started companies. Yeah. Um, whether it's people like Michael, Michael Carnage and Apricorn who started Skillshare and then you know, is on to something new now, or whether it's uh, um, uh, people in my team who have become really well-known designers in their industry or have become leaders in the engineering organization at Adobe. Uh, I, I, I never anticipated what type of team would come out of this en endeavor and what these people would end up you know, doing and contributing through. Uh, that's, that's, that was also like, an exciting thing of this journey is to see the people that it would develop. What did you, there's a line in the book I love about don't optimize for the short term deal, optimize for the long term. What did you, what is the thing that Scott Belsky gave up in the short term to have a long term success? The hardest part I think was the five or so years of explaining to people what I was doing and they had never heard of it. and just them being like, yeah, yeah, cool, you know, and me thinking that they were thinking, oh, good luck, good luck, man. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also being asked, oh, well, like, who's your VC? And it's like, oh, no, we're bootstrapped. Oh, you know, and, and having the implication behind that be, you must not be able to raise capital. Um, having to put up with that five years or so, especially in the bootstrapping phase, yeah. hiring people, going to events, you know, meeting people, I think that that was, it, it, it built some sense of uh, so, sort of in, internal confidence 
to balance out kind of the external uh, sort of uh, cynicism. Yeah. And I think that was you know, that was tough, but an important part of my journey. A lot of the book is focused on creators, entrepreneurs, people starting businesses, and yet right now you're the chief product officer at Adobe. You have thousands and thousands of employees who report to you. 128 billion, 130 billion dollar market cap company. What is different for you in this world yeah. than the other one? Well, I'm tr I'm always trying to find. Um, a way to be challenged in the areas that interest me most. I find that that makes me fully utilized. Yep. It makes me feel that sense of happiness from feeling fully utilized. Yeah. I've always loved building for creative people. I feel like that's one of those things I felt I was made to do. And I think I can do that in the context of a startup and as an advisor, um, especially on the product side. I think that being in a company like Adobe, building all these creative tools for the creatives of the world, um, I felt like there was a chapter that I was the right person to lead, and um, and that was what kind of brought me back and made me excited about it, and um, and that's you know that and it's also a new suite of challenges. Like I want to learn how to manage a very large organization. Yeah. I want to I want to think about what culture change and product you know innovation means in a large context. So in some ways, my learning curve is now steep again, and I think that's where I'm happiest. What's next? <laughs> well, I have some products to ship. Um, Let's actually could we talk about that for a second. So, we're, for those, this is you could be listening to this in 2025, or it's right now. It's uh, the fall of 2018, and we're a week out from Max. Yeah. I will see you there. Yep. Looking forward to seeing you I'm on stage. For that. Uh, is there any preview? Can you give us anything, or what's just what's in the news? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that um, I think that. The theme for this year is going to be, and this is my version, uh, <laughs> my version of the theme for this year is that we're really delivering on the promise of this thing called Creative Cloud, which was the subscription offering of all yeah. of the desktop tools that creatives know and use and love. Uh, but um, so far, creativity has very much been bound to the desktop. And, uh, and also, I think these desktop products still function as individual kind of products you download, install, and use. Yeah. And it's taken years to redo the architecture and to rethink what the customer experience should be. Uh, not only for creative professionals, but also for enthusiasts, anyone that wants to learn new products. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing I can be fine is that a photographer will want to you know, get his or her hands dirty with a product like Adobe XD or, or Premiere Pro or whatever, but they're just like so daunted by learning yeah. a new framework. Totally. So that's yeah, that's one of the things we're trying to change that we're going to announce uh, next week. Some really exciting changes there, and uh, and I think what we are going to do now is just lay a new foundation of what people should expect from us for the next few years, and this is the first kind of step of the inflection for for the um, for all of the products, and I'm excited about it. Congratulations! That's huge, huge, huge step for you, huge step for the company. I'm super excited to hear some things that are coming out. Um, Messy middle, congratulations, beautiful. Thanks, Chase. Like I, it's listen. I was it's, looking forward to this. I, I love what you've built. I just the inventory of knowledge that Creative Live has become, and what people turn to it for, and why. Um, it's nothing short of amazing. I mean, you've been um, in, in a messy, volatile journey yourself, oh, building something. And you've helped me plenty of times. <laughs> I've tried, but it's um, <laughs> but I just you know I admire it, and it's just uh, it's so cool. And and also what I love about the content is it does really apply to leaders of different. Of different yeah. situations, whether you're leading yourself through a creative journey or whether you're leading a small team or a large organization. So it's uh, it's really a pleasure. Well, something that you said in the book resonated with me as I'm applying it to my own life, and that is so many things. It's like it's it's not really just the tactics, or it's not specifically the craft. It's so much of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing just with, with the data of what people are, you know, emotional intelligence, body language, having tough conversations, all of the things that. Um, we think it's just the craft, and it's not. I think the same is true, and it really comes out in the book. Um, that's why they call it messy, right? It's not just about like the pixels and the design, and the, it's managing so many other things. Well, so. Hey, listen, the mess is meant to be mined. There's a lot there. <sighs> Appreciate it. Uh, it's just you're at Belsky, right? At Scott Belsky. At Scott yep. Belsky and everything. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show, bud. Really appreciate you. Thanks, Chase.